Hello. All right. Well, certainly good to hear all of your voices and happy new year to all of you. And I pray that the Lord has been blessing you so far and that um, each and every day this year becomes better in light of the challenges we had in 2020. Um, it would be so wonderful if just because the calendar turned 2021 that everything in 2020 would just stop. That would be great, wouldn't it? But it just doesn't work that way. Amen. So we have to persevere on until the Lord says so, right? Okay, well, let's, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you once again for the uh, opportunity we have as a people to gather and to be able to encourage one another and certainly to hear the voices of the saints and the energy and enthusiasm that so many have. We give you praise for giving us health and strength to be able to, uh, to express ourselves in that way. And I pray now, Father, as we open your word once again, we yield to the Holy Spirit because we are very much aware that only he can apply that word to our hearts and bring about in us uh, that which is necessary for maximum uh, benefit uh, to the praise and glory of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We want our hearts to be enriched. We want to be strong in our faith. We want to be rooted in the inner person so that we would have a steadfastness to be able to experience everything that you have promised us, despite all that goes on around us, <clears throat> all of the winds of adversity and all of the uh, challenges that are against us in society. We want to be able to walk in the light as you are in the light and knowing that we can walk in the freedom and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So bless us today as we gather. We pray that you would cause us, Lord, to, to understand the word, that we would have the enlightenment so that uh, we might be effective and that we might be equipped to accomplish the things that you have set forth for each one of us in the various spheres of life in which we live. We ask again that you would please grant me as a servant to be able to um, to uh, be used of you, Lord, to speak in accordance to the word so that uh, the people would understand those things that you've laid upon my heart or those things that you've given unto us to read with our own eyes and to, um, and to yield to the spirit of God for understanding. So, so have your way, Lord, in whatever's accomplished today, and uh, we will uh, give you the praise and give you the thanks, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, praise the Lord. We're going to uh, uh, go to the screen in a moment as we uh, resume our consideration of, uh, of uh, being the salt of the earth and what that means in the times that we're living in. Uh, I, I think I overheard you all having the conversation that I plan to have with you all about, um, uh, about the, uh, the writing, the conversations while the message is being preached. I think I heard some of that going on in here. Um, but uh, uh, I think you all got the point, right? Um, but I need to just say to you that uh, we, that we need to exercise ourselves with the same um, behavior as if we were sitting in the congregation on Sunday. I mean, uh, uh, Sun New Year's Eve, I happen to be looking at all of the, um, the chatting going on and I'm still preaching and you all are talking about this and that, this and that, this and that while the word's being preached. And I'm saying, now, you know, you wouldn't be doing that on a Sunday morning or if you were sitting in the, or maybe let's put it this way, you wouldn't be doing it loudly, put it that way. And um, so I think that, you know, if, if, if we believe that God is speaking and God is using the servant in, in his word, that we need to, to give the reverence and understanding and reverence and, and uh, focus uh, and while the word is being preached. I, I think you all would agree with that, you know? I, I just think that getting used to uh, this format, you know, that we sort of sometimes take liberties and, uh, and because we're in a new situation, but I think that uh, I just wanted to put that to your attention because I think that that's really <clears throat> um, a distraction for some people. In fact, some people have said to me that's the reason they don't put the chat on is because it sort of distracts them um, from, from the hearing. So I just want to ask you all to be of one mind and one spirit and just to uh, appropriately comment. But I mean, when you start talking about happy birthday and, and uh, happy anniversary and and you know, somebody says something, then everybody else follows that train of thought. Uh, that means that everybody has been brought away from the, the word to follow whatever comments that have been made. Um, 
So I just want to encourage you not to do that, to just stay focused and to give the uh, proper attention to the, uh, the preaching of the word. So I hope that you all are with me on that point and understand it. Um, I'm going to ask you to uh, consider uh, Matthew chapter 5 again. Matthew chapter 5. I think that, you know, we, we, we dealt with that last week talking about this issue of uh, when Jesus talks about uh, the salt of the earth and how a person loses their saltiness. And we wanted to make a big deal about that whole concept of what happens when we are, when we're losing our saltiness. And so I gave you 10 things that I think that really um, are consequences or, or, or impact or lack of impact when we are, when we've lost our saltiness or when we are being, as you see this first line up here, being neutralized. That, um, that when we allow certain things to be added to us, it's neutralizing us or diluting us so that we're not as uh, effective or the spirit of God is not uh, be, uh, using us or we're not allowing him to use us to the degree that he intends. And so I gave you these 10 things here and um, just let's, uh, I'm just gonna run through them really quick, you know, because they really are review uh, from uh, last week. Um, But basically, we talked about the Christian has become contaminated. And we made a big deal about the fact that um, the Christian has uh, become neutralized, just like when something is added to salt. Salt is a pretty stable compound, you know, sodium and, chlor and chloride. But, but I think that what happens is, is uh, when something is added to it, even though it does not uh, destroy uh, the the uh, sodium and chloride, but what it does do is it neutralizes it so that it is not as salty or as pure as it um, was, and it certainly cannot be um, used for its intended purpose. So neutralized salt loses ingestibility. Also, loss of usefulness for intended purpose. That's a consequence of losing our saltiness. All of us have been saved for a purpose and the spirit of God has intent to use us <clears throat> excuse me so that when we are neutralized we, we lose our usefulness for intended purpose and I'm gonna make a big deal about that uh, in a little while because I think that's one of the most disheartening things that I believe that Jesus could say about a believer is that they've lost their usefulness or in his words what good are they uh, loss of credibility with others no believability upon sight. And we talked about how Lot uh, went to his sons-in-laws with a word and they laughed at him or they thought he was a joke uh, because he had lost credibility in terms of being um, a righteous man or being a believer. Also loss of respect from the world, not taken seriously, loss of influence upon others, meaning in terms of witness and in our words, also loss of testimony about the legitimacy of one's own personal salvation. People don't really believe it. You give a testimony and they, they, they don't even believe you for real. And number six, loss of assurance in the heart from stumbling and stagnation and fear. And we'll take a look at that when we go to um, Second Peter chapter one in a little while. And then loss of urgency about obedience to the word and uh, the return to Christ. Uh, I, should, I should be return of Christ. I'm sorry, return of Christ. And the number eight, loss of fruit and fruit bearing ability. Number nine, loss of rewards at the judgment seat. And number 10, loss of conviction um, about serving Christ. And so those were just 10. We probably could just expand that to others, but those are 10 <clears throat> consequences or lack of impact uh, statements regarding those who have uh, lost their saltiness or who have been neutralized by what has been added to um, them uh, as that we've lived into this world. And of course, this is what makes it a tragedy. Every believer is in the hand of Christ. Every believer is in the hand of Christ, but in the hand of Christ and yet become useless to him is a very sad state for a person who has so much potential uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, we talked a little bit about the gypsum, gypsum effect or, or infection, and meaning, you know, gypsum that the contaminated, neutralized salt that's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled upon comes as a result of these conditions that we talked about. Um, uh, compromised, we talked about conformity, we talked about carnality, callousness, and cowardice. Those are five major um, results uh, for those who are becoming less salty. And this phrase up here, we say that when a person has become neutralized as a believer, it hinders uh, this phrase, it hinders the social application of Christianity, meaning that the Lord Jesus Christ, like we are, he wants to spread us all around the world so that there would be a salt impact around the world. And, and so when Jesus is shaking us out of the salt shaker, so to speak, and putting us on, on the meat so that the meat can be uh, impacted uh, by the flavor and, and, and the taste of salt, it hinders that process because it is not really useful because it has been neutralized. And so it hinders the social application of Christianity. And so compromised, conformity, mm, carnality, cowardice, callousness usually are avenues to which people begin to decline uh, in their saltiness in the world. Now, I want to just run through these verses that we have down here. I want to read them because, you know, chapter Genesis 19 deals with the whole dynamic of Lot while he was in, in Sodom. And then, of course, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 to 8 references that uh, from a New Testament perspective. And then, of course, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 to 9 will just give us some impact, uh, give, make an impact upon us because Jesus talks about um, one of the ways or the ways that believers can become uh, useless or unuseful. So in Genesis chapter 19, let me, let me turn there and uh, read it to you. Genesis 19, chapter 19, verses 12 through 14. Talking about Lot, uh, then the men said to Lot, that's talking about the angels who went to Sodom. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who had married his daughters and said, get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. Again, the seriousness of Lot, bringing a word to them, a word of safety, yet they viewed him as uh, a being, joke, being a jokester or he was making a joke. And that says a lot to how they perceived him based upon his regular pattern of life. And so he was not serious in terms of uh, being a witness or being a messenger for the Lord. Maybe even his own lifestyle was not as, as it should have been living in Sodom. And so when he went to be serious about it, they perceived him as being joke, as, as, as uh, being joking. Uh, in Genesis chapter 19, verse 30 to 38, Again, we find another reference to um, a very serious time because this is the time after Sodom has been destroyed. The angels gave uh, Sodom, uh, gave a lot of instructions about go up into the mountains because you know that's where Abraham was. Go back in a sense to where you came from. Uh, get back under that cloud of uh, fellowship uh, that you once had. But of course, he uh, didn't want to do that. He went to that city called Zoar, and then and it didn't work out in Zoar, or maybe he was living with a spirit of fear, 
So he ended up in the mountains, living in a cave uh, with his daughters. And we find in this passage that just how compromised and how impacted the mentality of his daughters were uh, as to what they did while in the cave. Then Lot went up out of Zor and dwelt in the mountains and his two daughters were with him for he was afraid to dwell in Zoar. So there's that fear thing. And he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. Now the firstborn said to the younger, our father is old and there is no man on earth to come into us as is the custom of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him uh, that uh, we may preserve the lineage of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night and the firstborn went in and lay with him, her father and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. And it happened on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, indeed, I lay with my father last night. Let us make him drink wine tonight also. And you go in and lie with him and we may preserve the lineage of our father. And of course, then she did the same thing, all right? They made him drunk. She went in and lay with him and uh, did the same thing. Thus, both daughters of Lot were with child by their father. The firstborn bore a son, called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. And the younger, she also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is uh, the father of the people of Ammon to this day. And so again, we find in these verses um, how uh, the children uh, being taken down into Sodom had a mentality that was reflective of the immorality of, of Sodom. And it says a lot to do with that, that continuity thing, that passing down, um, and also how children are so dependent upon the spiritual decisions um, of, of their parents. And so the children um, who have by this time have become you know, young ladies um, had a mentality uh, that was reflective of, of, of sordid immorality. And you see what happened was they ended up uh, laying with their father. With her. And, and what we want to look at is not just the fact that they, what they did, the sexual part of it, but also the other piece of it was the mental processing, the thinking, the, the reasoning that had no God conscience about it. It was no uh, uh, spiritual principle, no, no thinking about God. It had nothing in that at all. It was just a straight, carnal, um, worldly reasoning that resulted in pregnancies that of course ended up throughout the years being that which plagued uh, God's people through these uh, descendants of, um, of their children. So again, we just wanna make crystal clear that the issue of when, when saltiness declines, when a believer stops uh, uh, living that righteous life, it not only is a testimony and the impact upon them personally, but also those who depend upon them. And in this case, I believe that that Lot, and of course, you know, the whole issue of his wife was destroyed in Sodom. So a lot went into that decision that uh, Lot made to leave Abraham and then end up in Sodom and find themselves living in that situation. Now, let's jump to the New Testament. And I may have read these verses before, but just stay with me for a minute. In, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses uh, 6 to 8, this is Peter's uh, comments, um, you know, looking back at that situation and, of course, drawing from it spiritual principles for us today. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Excuse me. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous life. And he was righteous not because his lifestyle was saying so, but because he was a believer. All right. He was he was he was determined to be righteous because of a, he believed, 
but yet it is obvious that he was not living up to that because of the lack of impact um, and seriousness in which the world had around him in Sodom. And so he delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul day by day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. And so we find that even though his soul was vexed, and, and I believe that a believer should have pain uh, when they find themselves in ungodly situations, there should be a pain in them. And he had pain. He was not totally callous to the environment, but the problem was he would not get up and leave. He would not, his, his, his pain was not such that he would move his family out. It took God coming in to rescue him. And then they had to sort of forcefully or urge him because the scripture tells us he lingered. Um, and so there wasn't an urgency to depart uh, from the evil. And so he had to be uh, urged out because God was going to destroy uh, Sodom. And, and many times that is an evidence of someone who, is, who has lost their saltiness. They, they, they don't have an urgency about departing or separating from the environment that that's even grieving them, an environment that they know is wrong to be in. And yet, for whatever reason, it could be the pressures of the family. It could have been, uh, you, know, you know, certain enjoyments in the world, certain status achieved because he was someone who sat by the, the gate. And so whatever the reasons were, those pulls in the world were stronger upon him than the torment or the discomfort that he was feeling uh, in his heart because of his relationship uh, with the Lord. And so we find that many times people who, again, who are spiraling down have a desensitivity or a lack of urgency about departing from ungodliness. The last verse I would have you to take a look at before we move on would be in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 through 9. And these verses, Peter's talking about growth, this whole issue of adding, adding, adding. We're adding certain things in our lives which are resulting in spiritual growth. growth. And of course, in resulting in spiritual growth, we become not only fruitful in our understanding and fruitful in our activity, but we also become useful, useful uh, to the Lord. And this is what he says, beginning at verse five. But for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, two things are going on there, if they're yours, and abound. And so it is possible for these things to be ours, but not abounding. That's the other way of looking at that. So, so if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. So we have here a consequence, and that is that if these things are not abounding, if they were not growing in these things, there is a, a blindness that goes on, a lack of uh, ability to see spiritual things or to be as discerning as we should be as believers. It is a selective blindness. Uh, that occurs, um, you know, or a, an affected spiritual vision or understanding of things for those who are not growing. It says, for, so he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten 
that he was cleansed from his old sins. Then he says something interesting. He says, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. And he seems to be introducing to us something else that we need to be mindful of. And that is that people who are declining or people who are not growing do not have the level of assurance of who they are. And many times <laughs> an assurance about spiritual things in the afterlife. And so they lack an assurance in their hearts because they're not, they're, they're not growing. And people, believers who are, who are losing their saltiness, people who are declining or living in a manner that is uh, somewhat unuseful uh, to the Lord actually develop a sense of, or a lack of assurance in their hearts. And that's what he seems to be talking about there. He says, to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so to never stumble does not mean be perfect. No, but will never stop persevering in purpose. Um, believers stumble, they don't quit. And so people who are growing are not perfect people, but they're not quitting people. They're not people who, 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 who uh, fall away or people who give up uh, when they stumble. No, they hurt, they repent, they have remorse, they have regret, but they give themselves over to receiving forgiveness and being restored and continuing to grow. And the more and more you grow and grow in assurance, you are able to embrace the promises that God has given unto us uh, for forgiveness and restoration rather than being crippled because you lack uh, certain growth that is necessary to continue uh, in the Christian life. And so they never quit believing, they never quit repenting, and they never quit trying to be fruitful and useful to the Lord. And so that's how I see those verses. But the point I want to make is that there is a real danger a real serious danger that a believer can be, can lose their saltiness and become um, greatly impacted spiritually, even to the point where Christ talks about them in our verses of not being useful. And so we find twofold issue, that this issue of saltiness becomes a matter certainly for the corporate church, that, that the issue of the corporate body in the world is designed to make impact corporately. And I think that we find that that is compromised because there's so much division. There's so much uh, separation among us. I mean, there's racial, there is denominational and various other uh, uh, schools of thought separate us. And so we find ourselves sometimes divided and that dividedness in and of itself affects our salty impact in the world. Um, we're at a time now in America and in the world where we've had more churches than in any other time in history. And yet there, there is much debate about the lack of impact that the church is making, not because Jesus is not sufficient in empowering his church, but it's because the church has various levels of compromise and conformity and carnality, callousness, and even cowardice in the world we live in. And those things have affected the impact. And so the church corporately has a salty challenge, but also this issue of saltiness is an individual matter. And it may be clearly understood that the individual matter is strategically important because it, Jesus places us not just as entities called churches, but also as individuals we're placed in various aspects of the world and in various spheres of life to make influence. And that influence goes all the way down even to the, to the individual level, one-on-one -on -one levels, one-on-one -on -one impact, one-on-one -on -one relationships, uh, discipleship, evangelism, much of that is effective on the individual level. And so the saltiness of believers are, is just as important and maybe strategically more important than it is in a corporate sense. But either way, 
believers are in the world to make impact, uh, to, to persuade and to influence and to reveal the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ in word and in um, lifestyle. So Jesus asked a question. As we look at Matthew 5, 13, Jesus asked the question. After saying that you are the salt of the earth, he says, what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? That's the first question he asked. And then the second question he asked, can you make it salty again? Now think it through. What good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Apply it to a believer. What good is a believer who has lost his or her flavor? And then the question is, can you, can you make it salty again? That's the question that many Christians face or many professing believers are facing is the question mark of purpose, the question mark of being restored, the question mark of usefulness. That's a big question in a lot of people's lives uh, in, in the society we live in and in the world. And so I want you to, to think with me now along the line of the, the statement. What happens when we're too much like the world, the Christian based upon Matthew 5, 13, the Christian is worthless. Worthless for the purposes for which we have been left in the world. And I wanna make crystal clear that when I say worthless, I am not using that synonymously with being unsaved. I'm not using that synonymously with being unloved. Uh, I'm simply saying in terms of the purpose and intent of a Christian in the world, a believer who is living in a particular way in a way that have lost their saltiness is worthless for the purposes for which the Lord Jesus Christ has left us in the world. Please lock that in. And so with that in mind, we must keep this thought that those words in Matthew 5, 13 are spoken by the one who finds value in all. We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ clearly is the one who finds value in all. When we look at him in his life in the gospels, which reveal his, 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 uh, his godliness and his righteousness and his compassion in action, truly we know that Jesus gave value and worth to every, everyone he touched. And so when Jesus uses this um, analogy here, he's making it clear that when a Christian falls in the position of, of losing their saltiness, they have lost a value or a usefulness to him a usefulness to him. And that's a hard position and a hard word and maybe it's even difficult for some of us to swallow, but if we're following the words of Jesus, it is a very serious state for believers to drift off into a, a state of losing their saltiness, which they're being conformed to the world, falling into worldliness or various other avenues which compromise us. It's a very serious position for believers to be in. And so there is this phrase that one theologian lays out for us, and I want to just lay it out for you uh, and give it to you, uh, put it in your mind. He, he calls it the adulteration of sanctification, the adulteration of sanctification, that believers fall into what is called the adulteration of sanctification. Now, we know that sanctification is the is the, is the setting apart, it is the practical setting apart in holiness, the, the practical setting apart in holiness, where the believer is being made more and more uh, to look like Christ, or more and more holy, or more and more set apart from the world, practically, and has already received sanctification positionally. So the positional sanctification is solid, it's locked in. That, that's, that's never to be uh, undone. We are permanently set apart unto the Lord Jesus Christ. But the practical sanctification is the gradual working 
where the, by the Holy Spirit is setting us apart practically, looking less like the world, less like the life we came from, but making us look more and more like Christ or more and more holy in our practice. So he says that the issue of losing our saltiness is what he would call adulteration of sanctification. And that word adulteration simply gives us this point. Listen to this. It is something that is becoming poorer in quality. The idea of adulteration is when having something mixed with something and it becomes a poorer quality. That's how one would describe this issue of adulteration. It is the issue of becoming something, having something mixed. And remember, we had just talked about um, that, that the believer has been neutralized by the things that, have, that has become a part of their lives. And so the believer's life or the believer's purpose is becoming a poorer quality because of what has become attached to them or what they have um, added to themselves or allowed to be added that is working against the process of sanctification uh, through the Holy Spirit. And so when a believer falls into a state or falls into a place of losing their saltiness. They are settling for living less than we are. They have settled for a state of living that is less than they are. When we get saved, we have been made something. We have become something with the capacity to become even more in line with Christ. And so when a believer has allowed certain things to be added to them, they begin to settle for living a life less than they are, a life that is less than what they have been called to become. And so that word contamination, which we used earlier, the contamination of the believer, that state of contamination has become a lifestyle. The contamination state has become a lifestyle or, and this is the point I wanna lock in also in this whole idea, or state of thinking that has caused the saltiness to be lost. Uh, referencing, um, you know, Lot's daughters, as, as I talked to you a little while earlier, that issue of how one thinks or how one reasons they are not reasoning spiritually. They're not reasoning according to the Holy Spirit. They're not reasoning according to the word that they may have known or heard. They're reasoning according to the world and they're reasoning according to their flesh, the way that seems right unto a man, uh, but it's in leads into destruction. And so the contamination has become a lifestyle or state of thinking that has caused the saltiness to be lost. And for a believer, saltiness in our stance in the world, saltiness in our walk in the world certainly has to be characterized by three things. Uh, one, like Christ, the believer's life is always pointed to a becoming like Christ becoming more Christ-like. But also saltiness does not also imply or mean like Christ, but saltiness also means for Christ, that we live for Christ. We are his and our lives take the posture, take the bent of being for him that we stand with him, we're on his side, so to speak. And so saltiness points to like Christ, saltiness points to for Christ, but then also saltiness points to the reality that we're with Christ, that he is not only with us in terms of his person, but we are with him and he has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. And so that means that there is no time in life that a true believer 
has been um, forsaken or Christ has departed or the spirit of God has uh, just uh, left the person. No, Saul can just points to these three states um, that we can use to characterize or explain the believer's life who is uh, progressing in being salty. Now in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, Jesus uses uh, these words to help us understand more and more how he sees the believer's stance or position in the world. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, Matthew 12, verse 30, Jesus says that he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. And so Jesus makes it clear that those who are mine are with me. And not only are they with me, but they are, are, are living in purpose with me. My purpose is their purpose. And their purpose, of course, has been developed from my purpose. So if we're with him, then our lives are pointed in a direction that, are, that is consistent with his purposes, his desires, his goals, um, in saving us. But those who are not with him, certainly that's in the extreme sense of unbelievers, but also those who are, who are wa not walking with him or those who are not in fellowship with him, certainly who are living like the ungodly or living more consistent with those in the world are working or impacting the world in a negative way, which is not gathering, but actually scattering or causing confusion or be causing many to stumble at what it means to be a Christian. So please think that through for a moment. So like Christ, with Christ, for Christ certainly describes what the salty life of the believer should be. Here's a quote for you. Um, so for the Christian, for the salt of the earth to lose his degree of saltiness, the gospel would have to be, here's our word, diluted in his life. Um, if you want to put a note on the side, uh, Colossians, um, I believe Colossians chapter 1, around verse 27 through 30, those verses there talk about the believer is to have a life that becomes the gospel, that that. The, in, in reality, that death, burial, and resurrection is to be lived out in the life of the believer. And so if a believer is losing their degree of saltiness, the gospel would have to be diluted in his life. The person is the complacent Christian. They have become complacent, just living by name only, complacent. The person who does not protect the truth of the gospel in his life from what this writer says, the rainfall of other ideas and ideology. And so rain, water on salt dilutes it so that it becomes less and less salty. And this analogy of rain or water uh, the water or the rainfall of ideas and ideologies are, are upon or taken into the life of, a, of a, a believer and they're becoming less and less salty. And so that phrase diluted, the diluted believer is useless to the purposes of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a hard word to swallow. And maybe, you know, it might be new or foreign to some, that we could think of believers who are useless for the purposes of Christ, but that's what happens when he, when he said, we are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, what good is it? It, 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 is, it is worthless. At least it is worthless for the purposes for which it has been intended. That is to be ingested. It is to, to be applied to people's lives or applied, applied to spheres of society 
to bring about influence and persuasion, expose your Christ likeness, exposing the gospel. But yet a person who is not living in such a salty fashion is not um, worthwhile or shall we say not suitable for the purposes for which Christ has called them to live in this world. So please lock that in for a moment and think that through. And I'm certainly love to be prepared to talk about that at the end of our uh, sharing. And so saltiness or not, saltiness or not, is measured by the word of God. So when we talk about being salty, I don't want you to think that we're talking about some relative matter or some subjective matter that we can kind of make up standards or what we call sufficient or appropriate saltiness. No, saltiness or not salty is measured by the word of God. Though God has laid out the righteous standard of expectation, he has put his spirit in believers so that believers have the capacity to live out according to the righteous standard that he's given unto us to live by. And so being salty is a life that is looking more and more like Christ in the various spheres of our growth. When someone is not salty, it is not that we sit back and look at that person and say, you're not salty based upon what we think. No, the issue of lacking saltiness has everything to do with the standard of lifestyle in comparison to what God has said in his word. Please think that through for a moment, please. And so the question that I would submit to you is, are there distinctions between my positions on life and the world culture? That's, that's a question, that's a comparative statement. And when I'm analyzing myself, maybe, you know, this whole idea of talking about being salt of the earth and, and realizing that there is a danger or a potential for believers to lose their saltiness. So as I begin to ask myself questions, uh, we must realize that it is a comparative matter, meaning that I am comparing, comparing my life to what God says and putting that in the backdrop of the culture that I live in. And so I ask myself the question, are there distinctions in my life or about my positions on life that are different from the world culture? Am I like the world culture? Do I think like the world culture? Am I ordered by the world culture? Or am I ordered by the Holy Spirit and the word of God? Am I ordered? so that there is a distinction, there is a, a difference, there is a, a marked difference between my positions on life and the world culture in which I live. And so you make that determination for yourself in light of what the scripture says and in light of where you are in your personal life. You live in this world, uh, we, we all live in this world, we, and certainly we know the issues that are around us, the positions in our society, we know that there are clear lines drawn in certain areas and certainly we've come through this heated season, this heated year, not only of COVID, but the heated matters of, of politics and social lines being drawn and the hostilities over certain uh, lifestyle and moral issues. And so I asked myself the question, are there distinctions between my positions? And when I say my, meaning my positions as I understand God's word, are there distinctions between my positions on life and the world culture in which I live? The second question I would give you is this. Is there a difference between my foundation of good and truth and the world culture? Is there a difference between my foundation of good and my foundation of truth and the world culture. Does the world, the world has a standard of what is good. And usually there is a, you know, sliding scale. There is usually majorities determine what is good, so to speak. And majorities and ideologies and schools of thought determine a, 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 an agreed upon truth. But the question is, are those things 
uh, in a line with my foundation, which is rooted in God's word and the witness of the Holy Spirit in me. We're talking about being salty or not in the world. Salty believers will have a marked difference in their foundation of good and true in comparison to the standards of the world culture which we live in. That is why Jesus has us here so that we would, by being salty, make uh, you know, impact and that there would be influence and persuasion um, and conviction. There's another one and conviction as to what is right in the world. And so the believer that is losing their saltiness is toning it down. They're toning it down. They are being complacent, remember? So they're not uh, uh, taking a stand. They're not being vocal. They're not living in, in a, such a way that will cause conflict because good, uh, what is good according to God's word and good according to society, what is truth according to God's word and what is truth according to society sometimes will have a impact. Sometimes there'll be a conflict. Sometimes there'll be a real fight, so to speak. And um, that's one of the uh, responsibilities a believer has just being who we are. Ye or you are the salt of the earth. Third question I would give you is this. Is my Christianity, is my Christianity disassociated and secret from the people I deal with in the world culture I live in? Is my Christianity disassociated from, I mean, and secret from the people I deal with in the world culture I live in. Is it separate? Do I, I mean, because you know, salt can't be separate. It has to have a contact. It has to have a sphere of closeness to make influence. And, and, and of course, I know that there is this sometimes misunderstanding that people have about believers in the world, but we are in the world, but we're not of the world. We are to live in proximity to believe unbelievers, but our mentality and our direction of life is not controlled or determined by the ungodly system. We, we talked about this you know, several weeks ago about how the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. He has where he is working to infiltrate all of the spheres of influence that affect culture. And we see that, that Satan has done a very decent job in, in, in controlling and getting toeholds and getting a stronghold in the various spheres of authority and influence, education, uh, you know, all of the social media platforms, he's got, he's, he's done a good job, good in a sense of efficient. He's been efficient in doing his job. The question is, is he meeting the resistance of the salt Jesus has put in the world? We are in the world and we are the only entity that Jesus has placed in the world to be the salt that impacts people's lives. And so the third question, is my Christianity disassociated? Do I, do I leave it home? Do I put it in the trunk? Do I, do I hide it? Do I keep it hidden from people that I deal with in the culture I live in? And if that's the kind of Christian you are, then you are not being salty. You are being someone who is um, um, holding back and toning down um, that for which Christ has set you free to live in this world. I think I have one more question. Yes, here we go. Is there a distraction 
Is there distraction from Christ in pursuits of pleasure and lifestyle to those that live uh, in my sphere of culture? Should be a little in, I in there. Those that live in my sphere of culture. Is there a distraction from Christ? in how I pursue pleasure and in the, the manner and the activities of pleasure and lifestyle. Is, 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 is my life a distraction from Christ that people can't see him, people don't want to see him, um, or because we are so closely enmeshed in the same activities in the same way, is there no opportunity for them to see him? And so the, is there a distraction from Christ in pursuits of pleasure and lifestyle to those that live in my sphere of culture? Again, saltiness is not measured by what I think, what I feel, but how am I living in accordance to the Holy Spirit in me and the word of God given to me as the basis for standard and instruction for how I'm to live in this world. Please think that through for a moment. Uh, yes, I have one more question here. Hold it down at the bottom. If you can't see it, I'll read it for you. At the bottom is one more question. Are there destructive beliefs, are there destructive beliefs that agree with the world against what God has said? Do I have any destructive beliefs that agree with the world against what God has said? Do I have beliefs that are destructive, that I believe things that I agree with things in my belief system that are destroying people, destroying lives. Are there destructive beliefs that agree with the world? That's the key. Against what God has said. Now we gotta understand that's a really big issue. And even in our own society, there's a big issue because people tend to believe the unsaved world and, and, and maybe even some unlearned Christian, that if Christians say something, that is what that is the truth. That when churches say stuff, that that is the truth. And so they embrace these destructive beliefs as if it's okay with God when, it is, when the belief is not tested by what God has said, or, or, if, or when it is tested by what God has said, they choose to embrace the belief even though it is against what God clearly says. And yet, these individuals, many profess to be believers. And I'm saying that if you are a believer, you are in that zone of losing or having lost your saltiness because you have embraced beliefs that clearly are against what God has said. So the question I would have for you, and this is where we'll end it today, is why are professing Christians losing in their saltiness these last days? Losing saltiness in these last days. That's how uh, we will end it today. Because as I said earlier, we're in an age where there are more churches than at any time in the church age but apparent declining salty impact. And that becomes the basis of our discussion. And, uh, if, you re and if you recall, um, on New Year's Eve, the, the two texts I use to uh, certainly challenge our thinking and to prepare us for what's ahead in the new year is coming out of the book of Micah 
And remember in Micah 2, 8, he's, he said, lately my people have risen up as an enemy, which is unthinkable. But you say, well, that was them. No, because there are professing people today. And when I say professing, I'm talking about the visible church that have positioned themselves, postured themselves, and have practiced lifestyle and, and, and philosophies and ideologies that put them in a position against God, not for him, but, but against him. And Micah 6.3 says, oh, my people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? And then he says, testify against me. God says, now you, you tell me, you speak to me and tell me why I'm not worthy of your loyalty. What have I done that now made you go against me or get on the other side? And so I'm gonna end there. And, and next time we come together, we can pick it up and, and explore that a little bit because I believe there's some key elements for us as to why we are in a generation where we've had more word, more churches, and yet also more losing of saltiness in the age that we, we live in. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. Our hearts are open before you. And we know that you clearly see us for what we really are, nothing is hidden. And so Father, we evaluate our lives in the light of your word and our desire um, today should be that we desire to be salty. We desire to be effective salt in this world. And for those of us who are found wanting in great ways or in small, forgive us. We are so thankful that you so willing to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness because we can't make ourselves salty again. When we have lost that salt and fallen into that state, we can't redeem ourselves or we can't uh, restore ourselves, but you have been gracious to give unto us new opportunities to be rekindled, to be reinvigorated, um, to be re-energized for the very purposes for which you have left us in the world. So Father, as we uh, consider this new year that we're in, we wanna be more effective and more impactful for you. The world has risen up a standard against us and has uh, surrounded us and have come against us. And, and it is not just against us, but even inside of the visible church, Lord, we have found ourselves faced with much opposition because the sway of the wicked one and the preferences and the states of the heart of the world have become hard in confronting us with its standard. Give unto us, we pray, the courage and the, uh, and the, uh, the, the spiritual wherewithal uh, to, to embrace the challenge and to hold fast in the, uh, in the uh, word of righteousness so that the world would be impacted by truth, be impacted by what is good. And though it is a very dark time, many souls, many souls would come to the saving knowledge of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our desire, that we are be so salt that many will be influenced to come to Jesus despite the times we live in. So bless the people now, I pray, and we'll give you praise for it, Lord God, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen and amen.